It is wonderful to be back at IF4 again. And my opening questions here are rather simple, um, but they point to a host of more complex questions. Um, how do we learn, and in the higher education context, what should we learn? And these are important because across the US and indeed the world, we hear politicians and lay po uh, commentators today call for university training that is focused primarily, if not solely, in the hard sciences and engineering. Um, in the US, over the past year, we've even heard our president, the otherwise cultured and sophisticated Barack Obama, dismiss arts education as a waste of time. State and local governments in America are slashing funding for programs in philosophy, music, languages, and anthropology. At a time when we're confronted with the enormous challenges of cultural conflict, political strife, and religious intolerance, we're told that our hopes for the future rest on the solutions provided by technology alone. Um, this is foolhardy, if not actually self-destructive, in my opinion. It's also diametrically opposed, oddly, even to what employers in the United States ask for today. In a very recent uh, survey done by the American Association of Colleges and Universities on employer priorities for undergraduate learning, um, it, it was confirmed what we in this room probably already know. 80% said they wanted a university training that was broadly based in the liberal arts and sciences. 78% ask for greater knowledge on global issues, 82% more emphasis on uh, critical thinking, 80% more emphasis on written and oral communication skills, and 91% on problem solving in uh, diverse settings. None of these are science or technology based. To be sure, we certainly uh, uh, face many profound social and related problems, ones pertaining to global uh, threats of, such as environmentalism, uh, environmental threats, to the overuse of fossil fuels, and to escalating health crises. But I think that all of these and others raise questions about a much broader and perhaps more difficult problem that embraces us all from Osaka to New York to London to Moscow. In the very broadest term, the problem is simply this. How do we effectively communicate with each other across cultures and nations and learn to collaborate to find effective ways of addressing the scientific and other crises that we face today, as well as the unimaginable others that we will face in the future? In other words, whatever we may isolate as the or the group of chief global uh, threats that we face in 2014 and beyond, we have little hope or no hope of effectively responding to any of them without finding common ground across nations, cultures, languages, and belief systems. We cannot address global warning, warming, HIV AIDS, the threat of terrorism, nuclear proliferation, religious intolerance, famine, poverty, or any other social ill by our own lonely and isolated selves, either as individuals or individual nations. States often understandably act out of national self-interest, but none of the major challenges we face today is solvable by individual nations acting solely on that basis of self-interest, except to the extent that is, it is in the interest of individual nations to work together collaboratively and energetically. How then do we begin to solve our biggest and most fundamental problem of all? The challenge of living in peace, goodwill, and a sense of shared interests with our fellow inhabitants of the planet. By the end of this talk, I'll return repeatedly to that question because I do not think that science, technology, or business alone helps us achieve that foundational goal of living in peace, goodwill, and shared, a sense of shared interests with our fellow inhabitants of the planet. Science will help us cure disease, technology will allow us to communicate and travel faster, engineering may assist us in generating new forms of uh, energy and protecting against eroding agricultural lands and coastal areas. Business provides incentive to incentives to develop new media, new pharmaceuticals, and new ways of feeding our hungry populations. 
However, none of them displaces or challenges self-interest, national or personal. None of them provides the tools that alone will help us achieve our goal of living in peace, goodwill, and a sense of shared interest with our fellow inhabitants of the planet. For that, we need interdisciplinary training in the liberal arts and sciences, especially as informed by the humanities, the social sciences, the visual and performing arts, and cultural studies. Only, only interdisciplinarity can teach us how to cross borders comfortably, even enthusiastically. Interdisciplinary perspectives can save us from ourselves and the threats that are produced by a narrow reliance on science, technology, and business. I don't mean to denigrate any of the other fields or domains that I just mentioned. I think they are all necessary but not sufficient for achieving our long-term goals. Indeed, in the United States, one most commonly speaks of the liberal arts and sciences in that the sciences are included in and are central to a liberal arts education. I am dean of a college of arts and sciences in which the principle of liberal arts, principles of liberal arts education are embodied. The uh, College of Arts and Sciences at Lehigh University includes departments of chemistry, physics, and biology, as well as English, philosophy, and psychology. All of these and nine others existing harmoniously with departments of art, theater, and music. We cohere around our belief in and a commitment to a liberal arts education. So what then, you might ask, is not included in a liberal arts education? That would be training that is specifically vocational, tied narrowly and solely to a single field of employment. This includes engineering, business finance, and even some forms of computer science. Students who pursue degrees in those fields at Lehigh will uh, still gain some knowledge of the liberal arts and sciences because they take some courses in my college. Um, but the principle underlying their education is much narrower, of, uh, one of training for a specific job and acquiring the, uh, the knowledge necessary to do that job. We like to say um, that while engineering and business might prepare one for a job, the liberal arts and sciences prepare one for life and a lifetime of employment. The uh, theory behind a liberal arts education, uh, science, uh, arts and sciences education, is that in changing times, one needs the broad education that leads to intellectual flexibility, honed communication skills, and the ability to problem solve creatively by crossing boundaries comfortably and even enthusiastically. I mean, it's certainly no surprise that two of the most revolutionary thinkers of the 20th century, Albert Einstein and Steve Jobs, were also individuals who loved art, music, and culture. They had a complexity of vision acquired through a deep exposure to the original thinking, uh, to the original thinking and creative expression that lead to innovation. Indeed, Jobs attributed some of his most revolutionary advances in designing the first generation of Apple computers to the influence of a calligraphy class he took at Reed College in Oregon. The modern personal computer is partially the result of an immersion in Chinese character drawing. Similarly, Einstein studied and played violin and had a deep love of German philosophy. These were not narrowly trained technicians. What they exemplified was the power of interdisciplinary training and a liberal arts education broadly based. They expanded our horizons because the borderlands of their knowledge and perspective had already been challenged through the variety of subject matters and modes of interpreting the world that they encountered as part of a boundary-crossing education. The 21st century should be the century not of disciplinary knowledge and applications, but of interdisciplinary dialogue, understanding, and advancements. Yes, the philosophy student needs to study science, mathematics, even business and accounting in order to better understand how the world works and how solutions to the world's problems can be implemented. The great uh, French philosophy of, uh, philosopher of the first half of the 20th century, or last half of the 20th century, I should say, uh, Michel Foucault, spoke of different philosophical theories being like tools in a toolbox. I expand upon that to say also that individual disciplines, psychology, chemistry, earth sciences, history, literary studies, 
are themselves tools in the grand toolbox of approaches to understanding and addressing the challenges that we face. Every student needs the broad perspective, uh, a broad perspective on the variety of tools that are available to us um, uh, to face the challenges that, uh, that we uh, have, to, have to solve. While students may receive deep training in the use of only one or two specific tools or disciplinary approaches to which they direct much of their studies, they should be able to bring the, uh, their awareness of others to bear in deciding how best to tackle complex problems. That is the basis of the liberal arts background that I'm discussing, multi multidisciplinary exposure, interdisciplinary perspectives, and cross-disciplinary dialogue. I'm an English professor by training, but my cultural studies work and my understanding have been deeply enriched by studies in history, marketing, geography and geology, and philosophy. In acquainting myself with other disciplines, I better understand the limitations of my own. It's just as important, perhaps even more important, I would say, to know what we do not know than it is simply to know thoroughly what we do know. Through training in business and accounting, I know that a philosophical approach to a global problem, such as international conflict or religious violence in, let's say, the Middle East, is not enough if it does not address the economic issues that underlie much of the tensions in the world today. A philosopher can better understand than an accountant why individuals sometimes fear that uh, which is different and foreign, but an accountant or a business person understands better than a philosopher, often, how the marketplace functions sometimes to render th that which is different more knowable and appealing. When you have the two working together, or better yet, when both perspectives exist in the same individual, you have a richer understanding of the multifaceted global crises, crisis of intolerance and hostility. Indeed, that is what a liberal arts and science, uh, what the liberal arts and sciences uh, reveal to us as we explore them, is that we only learn through encounters with difference. Sameness reinforces itself. It is static and it is limiting. Just as we learn profound lessons by discovering the differences in methods and approaches offered by art, philosophy, physics, and psychology, so too do we learn profound lessons by discovering the differences in methods and approaches offered by cultures unlike our own. The paradigm of a liberal arts uh, education is usable, even generalizable, at a much more profound level. Each being on this earth has her or his own unique perspective, a horizon, we might say, shaped by language, culture, ethnicity, family and economic background, personal psychology, gender, sexuality, and other individual traits. Biological neuroscience also tells us that each of us has certain hard wiring in our brain that helps influence behaviors and needs. The paradigm of the liberal arts and sciences reminds us that every individual approach to the world around us is a limited approach, but one that can be enriched by encounters with and explorations of difference. Like the wealth of differences in the liberal arts and sciences, the diversity of our own human being is a diversity to be celebrated and explored. Only by encountering what you know can I better understand what I do not know. Only by hearing about the ways you differ in approach to a problem or topic can I understand the limitations of my own approach to a problem or topic. And that is what a conference like IF4 represents so remarkably. That does not mean I will always abandon my own belief and adopt yours or vice versa, but we can both come to a richer understanding of the complexity of problems and topics in the process of exploring our differences our horizons expand. The liberal arts and sciences embody the same principle, principles of ex exploration, testing, and enhanced understanding that are keys to a peaceful and productive human interaction more generally. Philosophers won't solve all of the world's problems, but certainly they offer us some insights upon which to draw and conceptualize an interdisciplinary approach to higher education. And I want to turn now to the work of one whom I feel um, offers us an important set of tools. 
On September 25, 2001, the German newspaper uh, Die Welt published a brief interview with Hans Georg Gadamer, world-renowned hermeneutic philosopher, regarding his opinion of the events of September 11, 2000 world in the, uh, 2001 in the uh, United States, the attack on the World Trade Center. His perspective was of interest to the journal and its readers for a couple of reasons. For one, Gadamer had an extraordinary breadth of experience upon which to draw as his life had spanned the entire 20th century. Born on Fe uh, February 11, 1900, he died at the age of 102 on March 13, 2002, less than a year after the interview. Though he had lived the first 60 or so years of his life in relative obscurity, um, he, uh, though certainly he was a well-known scholar in Germany, um, he became very well-known worldwide in the last four decades of his life after the publication of his magnum opus, Truth and Method, in 1960 and its English translation in 1975. Gadamer was, in his final years, considered the grand old master of German philosophy and was best known for his persistent call, or his, yes, persistent call for an intense and transformative dialogue between self and other, much as I'm calling for here. So the newspaper wanted to know, what was his reaction then to an attack in the US that left many people speechless or worse, calling for swift and violent revenge against all Muslim others? His answer was actually vague and um, rather uncharacteristically hesitant. After admitting that he could not yet fully understand or comprehend the event, uh, event ich durchschaue das noch gar nicht, the 101-year-old Gadamer revealed that, in fact, everything had lately become quite strange to him. Es ist mir re uh, recht unheimlich geworden. When asked if he still hoped for some form of global understanding through conversational exchange, he responded simply, ich weiß, da, es, ich weiß es nicht, I don't know. His biographer, Jean Grondin, comments that Gadamer no doubt felt that his philosophy as a whole had been called into question by the seemingly dialogue-ending effects of violence on such a grand scale. Such was perhaps the case. However, Grondin, the biographer, stops there, ignoring Gadamer's latter words in the short interview. When asked about a way forward, given the proliferation of horrific weapons spawned by the human fascination with the technological, he responded, was, is, uh, was, ich, was ich tun kann, ist eigentlich nur zu sagen, ihr müsst wieder freier werden. What I can do really is only say this to everyone, you must become freer again. Gadamer certainly had no easy or definitive answer to the many problems he perceived, but he also did not retreat into silence. He ended the interview on a provocative uh, provocation and a challenge. If technology serves only to regulate and dictate our actions and reactions, dann ist es besser ohne Technik, then we are better off without it. The seductions of technology and especially of easy technological solutions to long-standing problems of human misunderstanding and cultural mistrust should never distract us from the hard work of seeking freedom, as Gadamer had defined it for decades, from narrowness, fear, prejudice, and hatred. Indeed, these words resonate in the reminder he gave just a few months later in the last interview of his life on the occasion of his 102nd birthday, when he stated that his major doctrine remained then as always, people cannot live without hope. That is the only thesis I would defend without restriction. Hope seems innocuous, even un, an, 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 an innocuous, even uncontestable personal and philosophical value. However, that is what is lacking in many current calls for a retreat into solely technological and scientific training. They are, I believe, deeply cynical and self-interested. We who work in the realm of intellectual production, and especially in the production of new intellectuals, should attend to voices like that of Gadamer precisely because he advocates patient engagement, humility, optimism, and the appreciation of methodological 
and epistemological diversity. The grave challenges that we faced in, in the 21st century necessitate an emphasis on listening rather than simply asserting to others. Listening humbles us. It reminds us that we can never work effectively on the world around us without welcoming the work that the world around us and the others who inhabit the world would also do on us. Indeed, a fundamental concept running throughout much of my own work today is there, that our only hope for learning is through seeking and appreciating encounters with others, and the more or the less like ourselves, I should say, the better. Gottmer's continuing even deepening pertinence for me and for all of us, I believe, working in higher education derives from the generative power of several of his central tenets. Uh, of these, dialogue is clearly the most significant. Gadamer approached understanding as best addressed through a model of and commitment to dialogic interaction. For Gadamer, all existence is necessarily dialogic as we encounter the lives and perspectives of others, either in direct uh, interpersonal contact or mediated through literature or other forms of indirect communication. Such language-based interaction never occurs under ideal circumstances, of course. Our encounters are compromised through the imprecision and instability of language itself and through the difficulties of speaking through and across ideological presuppositions, cultural norms, and historical contexts. Nevertheless, Gadamer's challenge to us is to embrace the inevitably dialogic uh, nature of our mundane intellectual and creative lives. He asserts that we have the ability to choose our response to the complexity of what can be, at times, an overwhelming babble of human perspectives and foundational beliefs. We can re retreat into the shelter of dogma, or we can enter the cacophonous fray with curiosity, enthusiasm, and especially humility. Gadamer uh, geographicizes, I guess that's a, a, a real word, um, this dynamic with his chosen metaphor of the horizon. We all exist within a cognitive realm that reflects our specific positioning within a landscape of circumstance and belief. Myself, as a 53-year-old white middle-class gay academic man from the, uh, from the United States, I have a unique set of experiences and presuppositions that I bring with me to every encounter. Indeed, Gadamer reminds us repeatedly that there is no fully transcendent point of view. We exist within a perspective, horizon, or standpoint epistemology that reflects the sum total of our encounters and, as importantly, our use of those encounters. This does not uh, mean that we are simply a tabula rasa upon which the world imprints. We are instead agents, ethical thinking beings whose horizons can be static or dynamic to a greater or lesser degree, depending upon the decisions that we make. All horizons shift inevitably through dialogic encounters over the course of a lifetime. These encounters may be in the form of face-to-face -face and directly verbal contact between living human beings, or it may be in the form of reading or aesthetic experience. When I converse with another person or read a treatise or novel from centuries past, I encounter a point of view, or many at times, that presents me with a challenge. The other asks, what do I know that you do not? What have I seen or experienced that you have not? What can you learn from me? Similarly, the living other whom I encounter is thus challenged by me. Because of shared cultural background, class, or religion, our horizons may overlap considerably. The encounter may be very comfortable to me. However, the greatest intellectual delight comes from those divergences from which both of us can learn significant new lessons. Whom we seek out for conversational encounters, to whom we choose to listen and how carefully, and the respect with which we, we treat our most diverse interlocutors become key decisions in any process of intellectual growth. A fusion of sort is possible when we find a means of communicating through and about our most profound differences and to the extent that we approach every dialogic uh, encounter 
as a unique learning opportunity. Only through a forthright and aggressive attempt to learn from the other can our own horizons shift and expand in significant ways. And what we learn should first and most fundamentally be our, about our own limitations and mistakes. And this is true for our social and political selves as well as I assert for our disciplinary selves. No one disciplinary horizon is limitless or perfect. They are all bound by tradition, misjudgment, and partiality of perspective. They must grow and metamorphose through interdisciplinary contact, dialogue, and fusion. This feels risky, but is ultimately highly generative. Indeed, if there is one thing that I hope we can impart to students is that creativity and enhanced understanding can follow only upon risk. Indeed, an intellectual life must, must be a life of risk. Risking the safety of one's fundamental beliefs, risking the possibility of looking misinformed, risking a skeptical retort, risking that one might be misunderstood, and most importantly, risking that one might be proven wrong. The challenge to those of us working as intellectuals and working to create new intellectuals is that of disrupting one of the most fundamental and of uh, fund uh, one, uh, disrupting one of the fundamentals of most previous intellectual ways of being, that of a defensive, unassailable, and superior knowing. An intellectualism that asserts without listening, that revels in the demolition of the other's perspectives, and that remains sure of itself and the sanctity of its position in the face of all challenge is not an intellectualism that is living or dynamic. It is a dead and deadening narcissism. It's attractive to the insecure, the, uh, the overly secure, and certainly to the professionally ambitious, but it is ethically, politically, and pedagogically irresponsible. Deborah Tannen, who's shown here, has done some superb work on this topic, and I would add that beyond its roots in problematic social and media-driven behavior, which is what she looks at in the argument culture, um, it's also an effect of the curse of disciplinary dogma in her own realm. The challenge to all of us is to embrace the inevitability of feelings of uncertainty and estrangement in the face of ex the extraordinary diversity of beliefs in our world. As never before, we exist in a technologically abetted, often media-driven global conversation on issues of lifestyle, human rights, religious tradition, and class inequity. We will all feel unheimlich, in Gadamer's words, Disconnected from the familiar, scared, threatened, and insecure, as we encounter the strangeness of the other speaking or acting from a horizon that may be very different from our own. In fact, the heimlich, the quiet and the safe, the cloistered, the narrowly familiar, is precisely what the strangeness of the world should disrupt. To live as an enthusiastically border-crossing intellectual should mean that we all occasionally say, as Gadamer did, es ist mir recht unheimlich geworden. Everything has become quite strange to me lately. We need to have, we need to be regularly unsettled in our beliefs. If we take as a fundamental fact of our existence today an historically unparalleled and pervasive encounter with otherness through the innumerable ways that individuals today come in contact with each other and with cultural perspectives unlike their own, then we desperately need education that asserts the necessity of such unsettling encounters. Through commercial media, through web-based interactions, through classroom exchange, and through study abroad, leisure, and business travel, we in the 21st century encounter different cultures, languages, belief systems, religions, and lifestyles in a quantity and quality, potential quality, that is historically unparalleled. All too often, such encounters result in suspicion, exploitation, and ideological retrenchment. How do we encounter the unheimlich? How do we experience being unsettled without responding through violence, or retreat into dogma or fearful and destructive isolationism. 
I don't, of course, have easy answers to such worrying questions. But the questions are ones, nevertheless, from which we should never shy away. What I will continue to assert is that dogma, retrenchment, and reductivism are the worst of all possible responses when we are confronted with profound, perplexing, and even distressing difference. It is a form of hubris that characterizes not only political commentators and demagogues, the ones that Deborah Tannen, for instance, examines, but also many academics who assert the inviolability of their own truths, their own disciplinary perspectives. As difficult and even unimaginable as it may be for any in intellectuals, we and our students sometimes just need to be quiet and listen more carefully. In sum, <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> um, in sum, I want to leave you all with a call for an investment in forms of education and interdisciplinarity that are relevant to 21st century life. Ones that are respectful of others, but also self-confident in what we offer others. Ones that are self-aware, but not self-satisfied. Some of the most joyous moments in my own life have encountered, have occurred rather, in the process of conversing with others. Some of the worst moments in my life have occurred through conversing with others. Conversations can thrill us. Conversations can practically kill us. And they literally can do so if they lead to violence. We shoulder grave responsibilities in educating our students in a transformational intellectualism that is also welcoming and respectful. Technology alone does not help us there. What the diversity of the arts and sciences offers us is the opportunity to engage in a dialogue across differences, to work toward a complexity, an understanding of complexity and ambiguity. And, uh, in my own college, I have a project going that is the term dialogue toward understanding that brings in speakers, it sponsors fora in which individuals from very diverse perspectives attempt to talk about deep-seated social problems without rancor, with, uh, with the attempt to listen rather than simply assert. In our teaching and research, we must welcome diverse opinions and differing perspectives and through those gain a better understanding of the complexity of social, scientific, and cultural questions, as well as our own blind spots. Through interdisciplinary training, we prepare students to, to participate with respect, curiosity, and self-awareness in their professional lives and in their engagements with arts, the arts and in civil society. Our students are equipped to respond flexibly, uh, flexibly and creatively to the challenges of the future ones that we cannot even anticipate today. We can couple the practical and the philosophical, the applied and the theoretical, the scientific and the aesthetic. Out of that intersection and mutual enrichment can come a group of graduates who are better able to tackle the enormity of the challenges of violence, hatred, and intolerance. We need visionaries, we need innovators, we need individuals who are able to place their own selfish needs into a broader perspective of human needs and shared challenges. We need interdis an interdisciplinary approach to education as never before on our ability to, to cultivate tolerance, a love for difference, and a respect for diversity hinges our very survival. In contrast to those who claim primacy for the technological, I say that interdisciplinary education is perhaps our only hope for the future. Thank you.